imagine uh, baby seeds were floating around the air. And if you left your window open, eventually the baby seed could come in and plant itself in your rug and grow a baby. Uh, now, this is very absurd, very silly. But the thought process here is like, um, if you were living in that context and you accidentally left your window open, would you be responsible for the baby seed that has been planted there? So if something is whole, distinct, and living, uh, that is a whole person who will never be replicated again, that is alive. And so I think once that's defined, it's very difficult to say then that which we've just described, who we've just described, doesn't deserve rights. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Learn Arena podcast. I am Trey Goff, your host and co-founder and CEO of Learn Arena. With me, as always, is our co-host, Gabriel Mitchell, our head of educational content and in-house philosopher. And joining us today is a very special guest. This is my dear friend, Anya Baker. Uh, Anya has been active in the pro-life movement since she was 15, both as a volunteer and professionally. She's worked to facilitate collaboration among assistance providers and to connect organizations that support pregnant and parenting women and families. She has interned and worked with national pro-life organizations as an activist, lobbyist, and community organizer for comprehensive medical, social, and material support for mothers. Most recently, she was on the front lines of Mississippi's pro-life movement amid the Dobbs decision. She's a wife and mom to three boys, and she is one of my closest friends in the world um, and happens to be one of the leaders in the pro-life movement. So I thought, who better to bring on to talk about our controversial topic of the day? which is abortion. Uh, this is a particularly hot button issue that I've really been looking forward to discussing on the, uh, on the podcast, because I think here we can really serve as a good example of how to think about these things critically, not telling you what to believe, but rather how to think through these things to figure out what you yourself believe and how to think critically about highly kind of emotionally loaded issues. So with that, we will start, as we always do, with the what is so and discussing kind of what is so about abortion. So we'll start with kind of a very simple uh, question for you, Anya, and mm -hmm. answer this however you like, which is, what is abortion and why uh, does it happen sometimes uh, from a kind of medical necessity perspective, just the kind of baseline? Okay, well, I guess I won't do the thing where I go, and thanks for having me and all that, and I did bring a baby, so I am oh, I forgot to on introduce... brand. This is Fulton. I forgot to introduce Fulton. Namesake is Fulton Sheen, if anybody cares about that, and I, th I know people do. Um but thank you for having me here to talk about this, especially the two of you who we talk about this anyways. Absolutely. Um, so abortion is, I would say the, the steel man definition of it would be uh, the ending or the termination of a pregnancy. Um, I'd like to add in of a human uh, fetus, which is a, a, a stage of development of humans um, during pregnancy. So there can be social, economic, psychological, medical reasons people cite. Um, but I think what we'll talk about is whether it's ever just okay to do and the rationale behind it. Um, but that the termination of a pregnancy with a human fetus is what I would say in short. Got it. I think that's a, that's a really good, uh, that's a really good definition and description. Now, another relevant part of this and where we'll focus a lot of our attention of course on the ethics and legality of this. So I want to talk about a little bit about the kind of the recent history of this. And I want to break it up into kind of as kind of uh, prompting for you three periods, right? The, and we're focused on the United States here for obvious reasons. We're all in the United States. Let's talk about abortion first. What was abortion like from a legal perspective in the United States pre Roe v. Wade? Mm -hmm. What was it like from Roe v. Wade to Dobbs? And what has it been like from the Dobbs decision to now? What is the current lay of the land? And kind of give a brief description of what I'm even referring to there. Okay, so pre Roe v. Wade and Casey Dobbs, uh, Casey Dobbs, and Casey, um, abortion was mostly done illegally. Um, sometimes out of the country, like um, Mexico, was a popular destination because it's uh, it's a border border country, um, but typically was done by legal doctors, real doctors. Um, illegally. And so I would point out that kind of the, the back alley uh, uh, reference is typically because of people like entering a clinic, you know, the back way. Or I've the, always wondered yeah, where the, the, the secret from. way. I think it gives a, an image of like a, an abortion happening in an alley, but mm -hmm. it's just kind of like I'm going to the doctor's office after hours. 
I'm, I know a doctor, you know, a woman finds herself in a situation kind of like people used to always talk about basically anything taboo in the past. Um, instead of saying period or menstruation, they would say like when a woman becomes of that time or something. (laughs) And so if a woman found herself pregnant and had fallen pregnant and did not want to be pregnant and the doctor could tell sometimes there would be a, Hey, I know a guy type of, uh, refer, refer, un- unofficial referral. Mm-hmm. And then, um, of course there's all, there have always been self-induced abortions, um, successful, unsuccessful, but that's what it looked like. And then states, before we move on a little uh-huh. bit there, what, what time frame are we talking about here? I realized I didn't make that clear. So pre 1973, got it. Okay. 19, yeah. Um, and all of world history, right. but we're, you just, know, we're pre 1973 in the United States. Um, but then before 1973, though, states kind of one by one were passing their own abortion laws. So there were states you could get abortions in before 73, kind of like we see now with any other hot button issue like um, transitioning minors or abortion now kind of in the reverse. Right. Um, so there were states uh, making their own timelines as to when abortions were OK and, and why and um, that's what led up to the Supreme Court decision. Got it. So pre-1973, bit of a free-for-all, each state able to make its own decisions per the 10th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. 1973 rolls around, and the court has the famous slash infamous, depending on your point of view, Roe v. Wade decision, which we don't, I don't want to go into the legalities at all. That's not the point of the discussion. But what is the result of that? So after that point, um, states could no longer have their own personalized abortion law. Uh, The state legislators essentially could not uh, eliminate abortion completely. They had to have some uh, avenue of abortion or it would be challenged and then Roe would be called upon and then that law would be struck down. That's the limbo that states were in from 73 until last year's Dobbs decision. So um, every state maybe looked a little different Uh, how far they would allow it, but they could never get rid of it completely. And states basically just started, um, what's the expression, throwing paint at the wall, like anything that would stick. Um, What is it heartbeat? Is it 15 weeks? Is it 20 weeks? Is it pain capable? Is it, uh, we're just going to ban third trimester. Um, We're going to start looking at abortion clinics and seeing if they will comply with um, admitting privileges or can gurneys get through their hallways, like any, by any means necessary to limit abortion. But most of the time, um, if anything was a little too close to the first trimester, um, a federal judge would block it. Then it would go through the courts. Um, Attorney generals, depending on the beliefs of the attorney general, would pick it up or not pick it up and and keep carrying it. Um, So that meant and still means, and I'll get to that, what it means today, but that means that as all of you would remember, you could get a late term abortion in other states like uh, Illinois um, or um, New York. And then in some states, it would be difficult to get an abortion uh, 20 weeks or earlier. I mean, 20 weeks or later, you could get 20 weeks or or earlier most of the time. Um, So that's what it's been. It's been this game of ping pong for for decades. Um, And then finally, hundreds and hundreds of pro-life bills went through state legislatures and we got to what we now call the Dobbs decision. Um, but that's not what we called it before. Got it. So that brings us up to the Dobbs decision. Now, from the Dobbs decision, kind of moving forward to today, uh, what is the current legal and practical lay of the land? And importantly, because I think this will be interesting for the audience to know where you're coming from, what was your personal involvement in this? So the bill that became Dobbs, we used to just call it the 15-week bill. Like that was the casual term um, here, I'm saying here in Jackson, Mississippi, Um the bill was just the latest challenge we passed. I say we, I'm just talking about the state of Mississippi, not me. I was still in college when the 20 week ban passed. Um, so, okay, finally we've got it on the books, no abortions, um, after 20 weeks, but we knew that the only abortion clinic in Mississippi, which was in Jackson, Jackson women's health organization 
uh, did abortions up to, well, they would say 16 weeks. So we knew, okay, let's do a 15 week ban. Um, we'll talk about pain capability and, uh, just try it. Like I said, throwing paint at the wall, you never knew which bill would do it. And actually the year after that bill, um, the 15 week ban got passed. Really the only involvement I had was showing support on the days it mattered. Um, I was 15 weeks pregnant at the sign of my, with my first son, um, who's now five at the signing of the bill, uh, for the 15 week ban. And before that, I really had just spread the word, did the regular call your rep kind of stuff. I wasn't super involved because I was getting married and having a baby and all those things. Um, but then the year, the two years later, I want to say I did lobby um, specifically um, the Life Equality Act, which was another attempt um, based on a tip. It felt like a tip Clarence Thomas left in um, in his maybe women's health organization. It's like I'm missing up all the Supreme court memories I have. But when I was an intern, I was at, um, whole women's health, whole women's health. Um, when the decision was struck down and other decisions had been not heard, it seemed like Clarence Thomas was pointing towards like, keep trying this and maybe, maybe the anti-discriminatory route is the way to go. Mm -hmm. So we tried the Life Equality Act, which was banning abortion on the basis of sex, race, and disability. This was 2020. And so that was, my thought was, this is gonna, this is gonna be the one that goes to the Supreme Court because this is what the Supreme Court wants to see. They wanna ban abortion on the basis of discrimination, which is like the flavor of our country right now. So it was like, fine, don't, don't discriminate in the womb, right? And um, I had, there was like a state senator who said like, wokeness in the womb, you know? and. Um, so COVID happened, all of a sudden, all the national partners could not fly here. So I, a non-lawyer, um, my first year lobbying officially was by myself. <laughs> and then it was just like me and the Planned Parenthood lobbyists um, watching the votes. And I even brought um, my son, my son's name is Locke. I brought Locke to the, to the state capitol with me because I didn't always have a babysitter. And when it from a media perspective, it sounds like it's a giant, like octopus of power. It, it's literally just like a handful of people who speak for um, the majority of people in this state. And it was a, once it got to a vote, it wasn't easy to actually get that passed. A lot of people would think it would be easy. It was not easy. But once it came to the floor, it was e like everyone had to show that they were going to do a pro-life vote. So it went through and I thought maybe this is the one. Then not much longer of a wait, our new attorney general um, decided to proceed with the case that was left to her. Our previous attorney general was not really pro-life um, and he left and she took over and she pushed it forward and it took. And um, when we talk about the religious side of it, I have kind of a backstory on, on that part. But um, when it came, came to be, it evolved into the Dobbs decision. And that is because Dr. Dobbs during COVID was um our our um he he's the one who had to be the face because of of his state appoint, state appointed position but he personally dobbs i don't think like has ever said how he feels about the case so it's kind of funny that it's his name um and so that brings us to the decision the leak and then the decision and um you want me to talk talk next about what the law, like what the the layout looks like now le legally. Yeah, to wrap up our kind of what is so right now, mm -hmm. if you'll lay out for us a little bit. All right, Dobbs decision happens, which effectively reverses Roe. States are now, mm -hmm. if I understand it correctly, able to create their own abortion laws. Yeah. So where are we at now? Yeah, so there was a lot of fear mongering that this was going to make abortion illegal. We obviously know that that now everyone knows that that's not what happened. What really happened was that states now had the freedom, and that's how I would frame it, the freedom to decide as a state legislature um, what their state wants to do about abortion. So previously everybody was in limbo. They would try something. It wouldn't work now, not literally overnight, but almost overnight within days, all of these trigger laws that had been placed uh, years ago went into effect. So previously there were laws passed like 
if we ever get Roe overturned, this is obviously not how they phrased it in the law, but if Roe ever gets overturned and if we ever get the freedom to get for, away from this federal ban on our bans, then a trigger law will take effect and there and and this will be the law, which is usually no abortion or no abortion except the case of rape, something uh, much more extreme than was allowed. And um, what, Mississippi was one of those states. I believe there were seven trigger law states. And that happened pretty quickly as soon as the attorney generals um, took action on it to make it go into effect. And then the next legislative session, all the states were free to propose legitimate bans that they wanted, depending on what states they were. And the most recent ban um, would be, I believe, North Carolina when they they moved to 12 week um, and their their state legislature is really long. It's six months, unfortunately, um, for them <laughs> to be involved with policy for six months directly. But ultimately, all states started their own mini wars instead of us having one war against the federal government. Um, in the courts, each state has its own battle. Like Georgia has had its own battle. Um, each state makes uh, their own limitations. And then there's an in internal fight, which I believe is always how our country was intended to be set up. Um, so today depends where you are right now. People in Mississippi go to Illinois for their abortions typically. Um, and there's of course scholarships to get people to other states, but that's, Got it really it. depends where you live. Got it. Okay. Makes sense. That's a great overview for us. I appreciate it. Now, one last small note that uh, I think is an important point to make that Gabriel brought up to me earlier before we move on to more of the kind of in-depth discussion of the, the ethics and the pros and cons and the arguments for and against us was kind of the, and Exodus was news to me as well uh, when Gabriel brought it up, is American public opinion on abortion mm -hmm. is not as divided by gender as you might think. So Gabriel, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, kind of what the American people think about this and then lead us into a discussion of the ethics yeah. of it? Yeah, this, this segue is really good into the ethics component because something I've noticed when I'm diving into this topic and reading the literature, listening to the podcast and stuff, is that there's four or so main kind of frames going on. And perhaps the most common frame is the kind of frame around gender and feminism. And for good reason. We're talking about, you know, people with wombs, which tend to be women. Uh, and so as a result, it makes sense that this, this would be a very gendered kind of topic. And one frame that com commonly comes up is this idea that uh, this is men trying to regulate women's bodies. Mm -hmm. A problem with that frame and why I think um, it gets us close to the truth but doesn't get us totally to the truth is that if you look at the statistics, men and women support abortion at the same rates, maybe off by like 5%, mm -hmm. and men and women reject abortion at the same rates. Mm -hmm. It is not really a gendered issue insofar as it's not about men trying to regulate women. Women are against abortion and women are in favor of abortion and men are against abortion and men are in favor of abortion. There's much more fundamental arguments going around. Uh, and so what I've noticed is that there's kind of that, that feminist kind of gendered framing, which is helpful. It's certainly true that this is a gendered argument. It has to do with gender and has to do with biological sex, but it is not the full picture, which is why I've also noticed that there's a few other kind of frames. Obviously a big debate going on is simply a question of rights. A question of, does my bodily autonomy give me, uh, I guess in the case of a woman, give a woman the right to uh, essentially evict kind of the, the, the entity that is inside them, whether we call that a, a human being or a baby or a fetus or an embryo or whatever. There's sort of this debate about, does that entity inside of you, is it a person, is it is a human, is it deserving of rights? Or does my right to bodily autonomy kind of trump that? That's another big framing that I think gets to a very fundamental part of the question. But to me, it's also pretty obvious that religion has a big part to do with this. Um, it's not that every single person who is against abortion must necessarily be coming from a religious perspective, as I'm sure you can probably give plenty of arguments for why there might be a secular critique of abortion. But if we look in the United States, we look at what are the organizations that have been successful at promoting kind of the anti-abortion take, it is primarily uh, people and organizations that are connected to religious organizations, such as the Catholic Church. I even kind of briefly looked in the history, and I guess, I guess the Catholics were on top of this before even the Protestants, that for some reason the Protestants, it was not uh, a component of their belief system to reject abortion. 
but now the sort of mainstream Protestant evangelicals, it seems to be such a big part of their belief. And so, so I'm, I'm even kind of curious to dive into further uh, yeah. where kind of the history split. And then finally, I've also noticed a frame around consequences and outcomes. Some people in their arguments for abortion will point towards things like, uh, like crime rates and things like that. And, and some of those arguments I don't think are the best. And in fact, almost are almost suspiciously kind of uh, eugenics kind of arguments. But uh, there is kind of an, an outcome sort of framing that goes on here, whether it's crime or whether it's trying to promote a certain traditional culture versus promoting a culture of promiscuity. There are kind of these outcome based sort of framings. Mm -hmm. So what I'm curious to hear from you as someone who has a lot of experience talking about these ideas, who's read a lot of the literature, who's thought about these really hard, if you can provide maybe a few of what you view as the kind of best steel man arguments against abortion, and I would like to hear both kind of the secular perspective as well as perhaps the religious perspective. And you're totally welcome and encouraged to personalize that if, if it feels necessary to you. Sure. So to me, the shortest, most compelling pro-life argument is that what is inside of a woman, the do they deserve rights? It is a whole distinct and living being. So it's not partial. It, the DNA sequence is whole in its entirety. It's distinct in that it can't be replicated. It's not a clone. It's not manufactured. It can never happen again. And it's living, meaning that it, it meets the factors of life, um, the scientific factors of life. So if something is whole, distinct, and living, uh, that is a whole person who will never be replicated again, that is alive. And so I think once that's defined, it's very difficult to say then that, which we've just described, who we've just described, doesn't deserve rights. To me, that's the shortest answer. Um, now, like you said, some people acknowledge this is a human, but I don't care because it's in my body. Therefore, it's a parasite. It's a... Um, I think Walter Block would say it's an unwelcome guest. And so then I think you do get into the, the idea of consequences, like, well, how did this happen? 99% um, of the time, someone had consensual sex and the outcome was a pregnancy, whether that was the intention or not. And I've been in many debates where people have said, well, I didn't consent. I consented to sex. I didn't consent to pregnancy. I would say that that's then like an, an, ethi an ethical a debate to be had, which we can talk more about that, but I've definitely been in those conversations. Um, from a religious standpoint, I think um, I also, full disclosure, am Catholic, although I was raised evangelical, was evangelical most of my life, so I, I kind of understand both languages. Catholics have outlined, um, have outlined what humans are, what women are, what men are, um, what sex is. Um, that's why you'll hear like Catholics have a lot of kids. You'll hear Catholic people talk about how Catholics don't use birth control. It's not because it's just like Catholics hate sex and it's random. It's because these things like procreation have been, have been defined. What is the purpose of marriage? What is the purpose of sex? These things have been philosophized over for 2000 years. Uh, uh, evangelicals, and Protestants, I would say mostly evangelicals got into the mix and they're strong force. Like I work with a lot of evangelicals in, in my kind of work. Um, a lot of them did not get engaged in the policy and activation front until um, groups like Focus on the Family, um, Dr. Dobson, not to be confused with Dobbs, <laughs> Dr. Dobson and Focus on the Family, um, your, the Graham family, uh, Billy Graham and Franklin Graham. Um, they kind of had uh, Tony Perkins at, at Family Research Council um, in the 90s, as I understand it, the 80s and 90s, um, not to say there weren't evangelical groups before that. Um, it really kicked off this idea that Christians need to be involved in policy and the way to save the family, one front of saving the family from this um, postmodernism would be to get involved in state politics. And so these state think tanks popped up. Um, a lot of them now are a part of like state policy network and they're more economic focused, but some of them, um, for instance, like um, there's one in Arizona where they, they do school choice, they do um, anti-porn, they do 
pro-life, but then they also have like free market issues that they do. But a lot, there were a lot of state-based policy think tanks that were run by evangelicals um, post-94. So um, that's kind of, then, then they, the Catholics and the Protestants learned to work together and um, they obviously are better for it. They, they got a lot done this past couple of years um, and continue to. So um, that would be my, my steel man answer. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think I'm going to give kind of what I understand to be the steel man kind of secular uh, pro-abortion or pro-choice sort of arguments. Mm -hmm. And then I understand Trey is going to have some follow-up questions for you, but maybe even both of us. So uh, you mentioned Walter Block, and I'll kind of start there. So Walter Block, of course, is this libertarian economist philosopher, and he presents this idea that um, your bodily autonomy operates in a similar function to the same way like house property rights work. For the same reason I'm allowed to evict, uh, say, a tenant that's not paying me and not benefiting me, I should perhaps be allowed to evict the embryo or fetus that's inside of my body. Uh, And of course, uh, I keep catching myself saying me because I'm just talking philosophy. But of course, what I mean is a woman and her body and her her, uh, autonomy and stuff. And um, to me, this is a very compelling sort of argument, because even if you believe that the embryo or the fetus has is alive and is distinct and has some sort of rights, there is still a question of how much does that bodily autonomy matter? Just as the homeless person that I'm about to evict has rights, that doesn't necessarily mean that that those rights trump my autonomy to my property and so on and so forth. And of course, this is all dependent on just defining what are rights in the first place, which is which is such a contentious, challenging philosophical thing. And we could do like a three hour podcast on it, evaluating, you know, why did John Locke believe this versus, you know, people who believe rights come from the state or whatever. I'm very partial, unsurprisingly, to the philosopher Ayn Rand and objectivism. And when she talked about rights, she made a big distinction to separate her ideas from that kind of John Locke and even the way the founding fathers talked about rights. So, of course, we, where, where we agree is rights don't come from the state. Uh, and we might say something like rights are, say, some sort of natural fact that is a result of being kind of a, a human being, a part of our nature, so to speak. And one challenge with that, though, is that uh, particularly if you're a secular sort of supporter of that idea, the question is, like, where are the rights? Where is the right chemi- rights chemical or where is the rights gene or whatever? And so talking about it as kind of this natural thing can be very challenging. And so someone like Ayn Rand, who I think is largely correct in this area, recognized that while rights aren't natural in that sense, uh, and of course, for her, she's an atheist. They aren't supernatural coming from God, and they aren't coming from the state. They still exist. Um, she wouldn't have used the word social con- construct, but they are kind of the social construct. That they are rights exist as the sort of rules of the game for how individual humans who are rational, uh, you know, acting beings, sort of interact with each other to not to not get in the way of each other's right to explore and pursue your happiness. Part of this version of rights, though, is that it only applies to individualized full human beings and not what Rand would have referred to as a potential human being. So an embryo or fetus from this kind of objectivist perspective isn't truly a human being in the sense that it is not a uh, a separate rational entity that sort of has its own uh, its own sort of identity separate from the mother. When the embryo or fetus is inside of the mother, there is, you can almost make the claim that 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 entity isn't really separate or distinct is is the word you use, that it's almost a part of the mother. Uh, And of course, this is where then people get into some very dirty language to say things like, oh, it's a parasite or it's like cancer. And while I think those, that language is very uh, unfortunate, I understand that it's scratching at a sort of analogy to try to describe a sort of truth. It's trying to describe that the entity, the fetus, the embryo that is inside of the mother is not itself a distinct being in the sense that you're using it, or at least that's that's sort of the argument that's been presented here, that it is uh, almost like a part of the mother and is therefore not a full deserver of rights. And uh, to anticipate objections that you might have, or the little listener might have, we got to understand that rights are not this thing that is universally... Uh, fool in all living human beings. 
we recognize that children have different rights than adults, as they should, right? Uh, a child should not be able to consent to, to, you know, say an adult activity or something like that. Yeah, I guess um, we won't give them the Rothbardian. Rothbardian. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and and we also recognize that that people with disabilities um, uh, have different types of rights and different types of obligations, and require guardianship and things like that. And so it's not that unusual to say that rights have almost this kind of sliding scale defined by our level of independence and rationality and things like that. And so from that perspective, it becomes easy why we can understand that we would believe that a fetus or embryo uh, would not necessarily have all the same rights. Now, of course, the fundamental right we're debating is that right to life, which is a big challenging one to, to tackle. And so while I make these arguments and I do believe in abortion, uh, I do be myself believe in abortion as something that should be uh, legally permissible, at least up to like the third trimester or something like that. Um, I do recognize it's a very challenging philosophical subject, and there's a lot of really great conversations we had. And so to kind of close up what I'm getting at, I want to encourage people to check out, uh, there's this philosopher, Judith Thompson, who wrote uh, this paper, this very famous called A Defense of Abortion. And it's a series of thought experiments and arguments dealing with potential ways to sort of defend abortion. Probably the most famous argument she gives is what she calls the violinist, which presents this uh, thought experiment of like, imagine uh, there's some famous violinist and he's dying of some sort of uh, cancer or, or liver issue or something like that. And all of his fans kidnap you and tie you up next to him and attach kind of uh, uh, attach some sort of medical apparatus where he's receiving your life force and is dependent mm -hmm. on your life. Yeah. And the thought process is that, well, do you now that this, a whole human, full, distinct being is dependent on your life, do you have a right to leave and essentially abort that sort of interaction? And of course, we add these extra layers. Okay, well, in that first example, of course, you were forced into it, so of course you'd have a right to leave. But what if you kind of agreed and then changed your mind and so on and so forth? So she kind of dives into these topics mm -hmm. and goes forward. And so I just... I just uh, this is not a long enough podcast for us to get kind of a definitive argument out there and debate back and forth, but I just want to highlight, those are some of the arguments that someone who is in favor of abortion might give in addition to maybe fem feminist claims about like uh, making sure women have the freedom to pursue the type of life that they want and that they're not stuck into parenthood or something like that, which uh, while I think could be compelling also unfortunately frames motherhood as this sort of burden or problem or something. Uh, and so, yeah, I just, I just want to point people towards that. Check out, Ayn Rand's kind of visions of rights and how they relate to abortion, check out Walter Block's sort of evictionist types arguments, and then check out Judith Thomason, uh, Thompson's defense of abortions. And I think with that, I'll, I'll push it back to Trey, who probably has some follow-up questions for us just to flesh, flesh yeah. out some of the specifics. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to I want to flesh out some of both of your positions with a, a bit of a pointed or challenging question for for each of you. I'll start with, uh, I'll start with Gabriel. And remember, for everyone listening as well, the entire point of this podcast series is to show that people that have reasonable disagreements about contentious things can still discuss it in good faith and come away having learned something. So to that end, first for, for you, Gabriel, um, especially with the framing, a, a lot of the, the rights framing that you just discussed revolves around kind of this eviction framework. And if you'll, you'll indulge me for a second, where I want to use uh, Walter Block's kind of thought, thought uh, experiment there, the, the house analogy because I think it, it most clearly paints the, the picture for the, the question I want to ask you, Gabriel. Uh, if, if by way of analogy, we're comparing abortion to effectively evicting someone from home, <clears throat> there's a very critical component of that that is completely missing from a pregnant woman and the, the embryo, the fetus, the, the growing human inside of her, which is that the person being evicted voluntarily, initially chose to be in the house and further, voluntarily, initially made the decision to stay in the house beyond their welcome date. They violated their lease. They did something mean. They spray painted the walls, whatever, that led to their eviction, right? And I, what, I'm, what I'm gesturing at here, Gabriel, is the importance of kind of volition and voluntary action and non-coercion in that interaction. The actual rights violation happening with the eviction analogy is that the person being evicted somehow, some way, violated the property rights of the homeowner in that example, Whereas obviously to, to put it most bluntly, and I'm being a bit, a bit facetious here, but partially serious as well. Like the baby didn't ask to be there. Like he didn't set up shop or she didn't set up shop there. Right. Hmm. Um, there was no voluntary interaction that happened to end up in that position. So 
Uh, I don't think the ethical analogy there works the same. And apologies, Gabriel, if your, your point was beyond this particular analogy. I just think that analogy is the best to make the point I'm trying to make, which is yeah. there, there's, not a, there's not an act of volition that resulted in the person being there and then violating someone's rights such that they are justified in being evicted. So can you respond to that? Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that, that's the problem with thought experiments in general, right? Is it by definition has to leave out certain context and particular information? Because if we were debating kind of the specifics that match the example perfectly, then we would just be debating the concrete example of abortion. We wouldn't be debating a thought experiment. Um, uh, Judith Thompson has in her defense of abortion, another sort of thought experiment that I think is is related to this. And th this, this thought experiment within itself is not enough. It, you kind of have to combine it with other stuff. But um, imagine a context where uh, 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 she calls it like baby seeds. Like imagine uh, baby seeds are floating around the air. And if you left your window open, eventually the baby seed could come in and plant itself in your rug and grow a baby. Uh, now, this is very absurd, very silly. But the thought process here is like... Um, if you were living in that context and you accidentally left your window open, would you be responsible for the baby seed that has been planted there? And again, it's yeah. a thought experiment, so it's not a perfect kind of one-on-one -on -one example. But in her position, the argument is, is of course not. That like just because there's kind of risk involved uh, with having a child, just because you um, accidentally invited this entity in, mm -hmm. assuming it wasn't your intent, uh, which also gets to the thing Anya was mentioning about, like, uh, you consented to sex, but did you consent to have a child? Very challenging sort of thing worth investigating. Um, and that, that's kind of what I'm getting at here is like, uh, just because you did the set of actions that gives you the risk of having a child in you, uh, just as just because you did the set of actions to invite someone to your home, doesn't mean uh, the um, volitional kind of voluntary aspect of the entity coming into your home is what makes the analogy and the thought experiment connect to this. We're just we're talking about the idea of there is something in in there is something that is dependent on your autonomy, your property, your body, and by the nature of what it means to have bodily autonomy, you have a right to evict, or in this case, an abortion to sort of remove it. Uh, and I, I hope that kind of answers what you're getting at. And I'm not sure if it did, though. It did. Thank you. That's yeah. exactly what I was getting at. Now, Anya, I have two for you as well. Can I? Can I? Oh, please. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I'm glad the violinist came up because I was going to bring it up if it didn't come it's up. Classic. Yeah. What, whether it's a, a cabin in, the, in a blizzard or a hot air balloon or a, a violinist being captured in the night, um, the thing that just all, I always come again or the windows down and there's baby seeds floating around. The, the thing that I always arrive at is why do we talk about this is rhetorical, but why do we talk about sex? Like it's it, like we have to have sex, like we need food and water. And that's a whole different argument, but there are people who are not having sex and there are people who live like chastely their whole lives. Um, it's kind of something that's just strange to me in our modern culture that we that we act like getting pregnant is the same as being captured in the night or oh no something floated into my car um like we don't know what it is 99 percent of the time i will say that you know there's different discussion nuance on on rape because it's not consensual but um I think we, we, at the end of the day, really don't like the idea of consequences and really don't want things to be what they are. Like we don't want a woman to be a woman. We don't want sex to be sex. We don't want marriage to be marriage. And I think that that's probably where all of those arguments will like come to the crux of like sex and, and consent and oh, re what, what are we consenting to? Um, I just wanted to note that I do find it interesting that these arguments always come back to kind of an argument, kind of a discussion I have with my oldest son a lot, which is I hurt myself. Well, what were you doing? I was climbing on all the furniture. Well, it sounds like you set yourself up for that and you shouldn't do that again. Um, I realize the consequences are more serious when you're talking about a pregnancy, but I do think that it, it, it reminds me of that conversation. Like, what were you doing? Yeah, How did so you get here? This is the perfect segue into the first thing I was going to ask you, which is I was going to refer us back to that the comment you made earlier about how some uh, some uh, pro-choice activists and pro-choice kind of advocates will say the nice cliche of "Yeah, I consented to sex. I didn't. I didn't consent to pregnancy mm -hmm. effectively." Now, I actually haven't heard that that often, and have never given it a lot of credence for the simple reason that 
Uh, it always seemed a little like prima facie absurd to me. Uh, the analogy I've always thought of, I'm, I'm a car guy, right? I love driving fast. And the analogy I've always thought of is like, say I'm going hundred miles an hour down the interstate and I get in a wreck and I total my car and I get hurt. And then I'm like, what, how did, how could this have happened? I didn't consent to getting in a wreck. That's insane. I, what, I didn't want to do this. Like the car violated my rights. Like it, it is so prima facie absurd to me. I've never actually thought about it that much. So could you dive into this a little bit more, flesh this out for us a little bit? Like, is it, is the argument, I'm genuinely trying to even understand mm -hmm. the argument here. Is there argument that they, sh you, you, the, the, the consent to the causal result of an action is separate from the consent to the action? Yeah, I would say my most charitable depiction of what what um, a pro-choice person is saying is people need sex. It, it's inconsequential, ir irrelevant um, what that sometimes babies come from sex. Besides that, aside from that, people need sex. People should be able to have sex and they shouldn't be worried about having a whole ass family because they had sex at that time. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's, I, I believe Gabriel, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I believe that that would be the belief that sex is separate from the idea of sometimes it happens to make a baby. Yeah. And, and also that, um, uh, not all consequences are equal. So like, uh, your child falls off a chair and he hurts himself. There's a consequence mm -hmm. of the pain, but, is, but right. does that mean that, uh, he's not allowed to get a band aid or something, you know, that, that yeah. that's kind of some extra steps that might but be taken. I, But I think that. I think my position would be that that is how life is. It, unfortunately, small moments in time and small mistakes cause big problems. Car accidents, drinking while driving. Uh, someone did not want to kill an entire minivan full of a family, but unfortunately, they were just driving one mile home and weren't paying attention or were, had one too many beers. Um, I have a, a brain injured child and his whole life is never going to be anything like a typical life because of one hour of his life and a you know few decisions made or not made that unfortunately to me is the the thing that um postmodernism in general doesn't confront which is like what is it like what's true what's reality and the reality is i've i have three children and like it didn't take that long to start that ball right. <laughs> moving like all combined. Right. <laughs> That's the reality of it. Right. That makes sense. Okay. Uh, I wanted to park on that for a second because it mm -hmm. was interesting to me. I want to flesh it out a little bit. Yeah. Now the kind of more pointed question I had for you is also the, the final frame on the kind of uh, abortion debate. And I'll, I'll frame this one a little bit, um, which is the more utilitarian consequentialist approach, uh, whatever the case may be. And while um, you didn't make the argument from this perspective at all, I've heard a lot of pro-life advocates make a utilitarian argument in favor of abortion, I mean, in favor of, uh, of banning abortion mm -hmm. along the lines of like, it's a potential human life that uh, could create massive good in the world, could be positive yeah. impact, could have a great life, whatever. And with the, the obvious retort to that being twofold, I want you to re respond to both of these, if you don't mind. Yeah. The first being like, well, their life could also be terrible. And in fact, empirically, we know a lot mm -hmm. of the people that like, do have abortions are often in low income kind of impoverished neighborhoods. Um, that kid is probably going to grow up like his mother, frankly, didn't want him or her initially. Right. So the parental care might not be there. Mm -hmm. Uh, they might end up, what I'm driving at is they might end up having a really bad life, like on net, just a really, yeah. really bad existence, uh, relative to, uh, uh, what they otherwise could have had potentially. Um, and then the second thing related to this, and again, you didn't make this argument, but others do, um, which is that, we have kind of a, a duty to care for the child, uh, even even in in utero, because the child cannot is not self sufficient; it can't care for itself. But I've always found that argument a bit perplexing because if you followed that to its conclusion, then that also necessitates right having an, a deep ethical obligation to ensure getting the child to self sufficiency, which might be I mean put the age wherever 15, yeah. 16, 18, whatever. So again, to to restate for you, make it clear. A, uh, what, is, what is your kind of pushback? What are your thoughts on that idea, right? That like you're effectively, I'm going to put this as kind of aggressively as possible for you to respond to. Like mm -hmm. uh, you're dooming a child to a really bad life, right? And then B, uh, if we have an ethical obligation to uh, keep the fetus alive in utero because it's not self-sustainable, does that not then obligate us to 
a bunch of other stuff like pick your favorite progressive policy for supporting young kids, like subsidies, tax credits, mm -hmm. a strong welfare state, et cetera. Uh, does it not kind of obligate us, and even on an individual level, to to kind of support and facilitate the the mm -hmm. getting the child to self sufficiency effectively? Yeah. So I, I should have said sooner that Equal Rights Institute and Life Training Institute are really good materials with thought experiments and answers to some of these things that Gabriel mentioned. Uh, but also they point out that you should not use the, like you could have killed the next president. You kill, could, have, could have killed the person who cured cancer um, because you can just as easily say you could have killed the like latest Hitler. It, it's like equal weight. So it's not a good argument. Um, for either side to use. Um, I know there's also been a good amount, for instance, like in Freakonomics, the study of um, Romania, right? And the crime levels decreasing. It's just a bit icky, kind of like Gabriel was saying. It does feel, I know that's not a very philosophical point to make. It is a bit icky. Well, I want to tag here very briefly, because <laughs> yep, this yep, is my yep. more area of expertise. That study failed to replicate and has been thoroughly, thoroughly eviscerated since. Uh, aside from the pro life, pro, the, the methodology was really bad. That study's. Broke. Yeah. Romania is super interesting, though. So, I mean, I guess I'm glad they looked at it. But um, it, it's, it becomes more of a, a question of like, does what someone might turn into determine their humanity now? I don't think so, because there have been plenty of people who were given. Um, wealth and prosperity and a whole home who messed up a bunch and have a horrible life. And there's plenty of people who on the books um, should not have had any success. And we, we know a lot of stories like that. Um, so I just don't, I think in the same way that the could have been the next president or could have been Hitler goes, I, I think he, you can't say, you could say statistically, this is the likelihoods and uh, of these things happening. But you can never know that baby in particular in question, like what their life will come to be. You, you can't. So I, I think you could say statistically this and this is probable, but ultimately you'd be making a big guess at the baby in question. Right. That makes sense. And then to jog your memory a little bit on the other part of this, which is do, does the pro-life argument about sustainability of life, self-sufficiency, mm -hmm. obligate us to a bunch of other, say, welfare state policies or a bunch of other stuff because the child is not, in fact, self-sufficient for decades? Yeah, it, it is strange. Sometimes you'll hear, like, pro-choice Republicans who care most about fiscal issues. But beyond that, I don't hear that a lot. Um, let's see if I can say this word that I always mess up. Uh, most Christians would believe believe in subsidiary subsidiarism. Subsidiarityism. Yes, I, I'm so bad at that word, and it's unfortunate because it comes up a lot. Um, so we've gotten away from that, unfortunately, by replacing the church with the state. Um, but the idea is that we are responsible as a society. However, it becomes difficult to be there um, the way we want to be. Uh, because of our high costs and high taxes, because we tried to outsource that responsibility that was ours. Um, but I do believe if we're just talking theory that we are responsible, um, we are responsible as Christians. I would not say that a non-Christian is responsible um, because they haven't agreed to Christianity. Yeah. Um, I believe other religions also have con social contracts like that. Yeah. Um, but I think the Christian movement, and that's the kind of work I've been doing um, the last three years more deeply, is the resource side of things and finding all the ministries that exist and what they offer and who can get it and when. Um, I've been culminating those resources um, for a few years now, and 9.8 times out of 10, it is Christians, and that is why they're doing it. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, that's a good one. So uh, two final kind of closing points here. This first one, I actually want to hear from the both of you um, and, and credit to Gabriel for, for thinking of this uh, uh, question. I think it's a good one. Do, is there some sort of ethical delineation or ethical difference between, let's say, a 12-week, 14-week, 15-week, whatever, like abortion procedure, like a surgical procedure mm -hmm. versus the two-week, three-week, like the, the, the girl in question literally just mm -hmm. realized she was pregnant. She knows she got pregnant maybe two weeks ago and takes the, the abortion pill, so to speak. Is mm -hmm. there 
an ethical distinction to be made there at all? And I want to hear from you on this, Anya, and you as well, Gabriel. So go ahead, Anya. I would say it, it's always the same thing. It's just it just looks different. Um, one one acronym I didn't get into. It's called SLED from Life Training Institute: Size, Level of Development, Degree of Dependency, Environment, and Degree of Dependency. Um, those are the things that people try to take humanity away from the embryo or the fetus. Is it because it's small, it's size? Is it because um, it's uh, level of dependency? That's why. Is it because of the environment it's in? It's inside you versus outside of you. Um, is it because because of uh, the uh, degree of, I don't know how I'm doing out of order, baby distraction, degree of dependency? I think I already did that. Whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, are we basing it because it looks like a baby? I mean, it definitely doesn't help <laughs> to, if, if you're pro-choice, I think probably to see a baby um, with a scrush, crushed skull. There are recent pictures of the, of the that's called the five, the five babies um, that were found in, in DC from a, a pro-life activist, a secular pro-life activist actually. Um, and those pictures are all over the internet of those babies. And I think that has power in the way that like Emmett Till had political, that, that those images had political power um, and emotional ethical power. But I, I think it is the same thing, um, which is why like even back in college, we talked about plan B, right? Um, so I, I think it is the same thing, but I think it, it's, it's the baby being able to feel pain makes it worse. Um, and I think, you know, a baby, that if it was just delivered would survive is even sadder. Um, but it, it's just a, an emotional response, you know, to, to it being feeling worse emotionally. But in, in the end of the day, it, it is the same thing. It doesn't become something different. It was whole distinct and living from conception. Got it. Hey, what about you, Gabriel? I want to hear your thoughts on this too. Yeah. So uh, I acknowledged kind of before that I do think the morality gets very challenging the later on in the pregnancy. Um, you know, people kind of cut off with the trimesters. And so the third trimester to me is, is where it's really up in the air. And I just don't know philosophically. Um, but like in the very, very beginning, you can use plan B and plan B isn't even abortion. It just prevents the fertilization. As far as I understand the science, it prevents Most, the ovulation. Some of the time. Yeah. 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 So, so plan B, I think even from a, a anti-abortionist perspective should most likely be supported unless the unless the position isn't anti-abortion but is more pro having children or something like that which there are some distinctions to be made there um but then in between there's there's what's sometimes referred to as plan c which is yeah. uh, uh sometimes it's called branding. abortion pills That's marketing yeah yeah it's a very if interesting plan kind b, of marketing if right? plan a didn't work and plan b didn't work and you have plan c it's no big deal yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and, and there's a couple different versions of this. I understand. I understand there's some that basically just induce like a miscarriage. Um, mm -hmm. And then I don't know if, if what I'm about to explain is the same thing or if it's something different, but there's some that just cut off the resource flow, basically cut off the nutrient flow uh, from the, the mother to the, the fetus. And it does seem to me that there's a big difference between actively killing, you know, getting the clamper and ripping them out uh, and that, that very like aesthetically unpleasing kind of experience um, versus just letting, just refusing to give them your resources. Because um, mm -hmm. even from like a libertarian perspective, when it comes to like living adults, there's a big difference between actively killing someone versus just refusing to give them your stuff. Um, and they kind of pass away. And so, so I don't know enough, enough about the science of the specifics mm -hmm. of the Plan C stuff to, to talk about it much beyond that. But I do wonder if there is a, a meaningful distinction between the type of abortion that is an act of killing versus the type of abortion that is simply letting them die. Got it. So that's, uh, I think covers all of the arguments on both sides pretty well. Um, two more, I want to do two more kind of rapid fire things on the ethics discussion, yeah. and then we'll close with a kind of discussion of what the future looks like. Mm -hmm. um, so the last two ethical things. First, um, we've touched on this kind of briefly and in a number of indirect ways. Can you take a few minutes to make the direct religious Christian case specifically uh, in favor of the pro-life argument? And obviously you're Catholic now, take the Catholic view, personalize this as much as you want. A lot of our audience is religious and Christian mm -hmm. specifically, so I think they would benefit from hearing what this actual rigorous theological-based argument is. Well, I think whether someone's Protestant or Catholic or regardless of their denomination, Christians believe in uh, providence, 
And so if a, if a human comes to be, the idea is that God has a plan for their life. Um, people often talk about the verse in Jeremiah, for I know the plans I have for you. And um, so the idea is that God, like the what your granny might say is like, God doesn't make mistakes. Um, like a person being created can never be a mistake. And there's always, that person always matters. And there's always potential for that person. Um, and nothing justifies killing ruining God's plans or, you know, uh, defying God's creation, um, that knowing better than God is what the entire fall of Lucifer was about. Right. And so it, it, it really gets to the crux of the faith, which is why it's so bizarre to see, um, pro-choice Christianity, um, everywhere. It's in, in my opinion, putting the self, um, the self indulgence, my desire for sex on demand above God's plan for creation. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. And this is a small sub point on this, but I'm just really intellectually curious and I want to hear Gabriel, what you found in your kind of reading, but your personal take as well on you. Mm-hmm. Why, when I think of the pro-life movement, I think of Catholics for some reason, mm-hmm. as you mentioned earlier, Catholics got to this like way before Protestants did. And it was a thing for them way before. Why is that? But I want to hear your view and then Gabriel, what you, what you found reading as well. Um, well, I think the reason evangelicals got really into it was what I was uh, talking about with the the kind of state based policy uh, kickoff that happened like later twentieth century. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think Catholics have always seen child sacrifice. I mean, like Catholics throughout history, um, you know, heated but you know heated debate. But when they got to civilizations that killed babies, they put an end to it. Yeah. Um, a lot of conversions, I believe, were conversion forced conversions maybe um conversions were like how are you treating humans here like what like sac- child sacrifice human sacrifice um and 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 deeper still the catholics have mass you know they don't just have a church service they have specifically a mass and the point of mass is the eucharist or the the host which is christ's body and, and blood and the the belief is that jesus was the sacrifice for the atonement of our sins, we celebrate and remember his death um, with a sac- with the sacrifice pl- replayed over and over again, and that the inverse, the evil opposite of that, would be to create an equal uh, slaughter for um, their own mass, their own sacraments, the the sacraments of uh, a lot of people talk about this. I'm not the first to talk about it, but that that everyone's religious in one way or another and the sacraments of the the secular world um have inverses of religion and happen to really sound a lot like catholicism you know Mm -hmm. um you got saints like ruth bader ginsburg you've got um excommunication being george floyd being can't yeah being canceled as excommunication atonement apologizing for your white privilege um you know confession uh Um, being inherent sin, like being born white, you know, all of these things have an inverse. We could go on and on about that concept, but um, I believe as many Catholics believe that, that we see a sacrifice of something else. We see blood um, because it's a a inverse relationship that, that someone innocent would die for us. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Gabriel, what did you find kind of just from the raw historical perspective? Yeah. A couple, a couple of things I noticed. One is you can find Christians from basically any era having arguments against abortion. Um, that doesn't mean that the dominant belief within Christianity at those times were against abortion, but you could definitely find writings. Um, and something, there's two things I thought was really fascinating. One was, uh, in the medieval era. So of course the Catholic church would have been pretty dominant with also, of course, the development of like the Anglican tradition and stuff. Um, and most notably, they would have been, you know, what we refer to as, as the uh, scholastic tradition, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, and uh, there are some interesting writings about how Aristotle, Aristotle in, in, in the Greek era, makes a distinction between a formed fetus and an unformed fetus. So he just basically declares that there's a, some, some part of the pregnancy where the fetus becomes formed is what he used. And so some of the Christian scholars in the medieval era sort of latched onto that because they really just liked Greek philosophy and were very much latching onto it. And so you can even find medieval era Catholics who uh, either were were supporting of early, early abortion or at least view it as a lesser sin, uh, which Mm -hmm. is a big distinction. But um, I thought that was really fascinating. 
but most of the history I've seen is that Catholics specifically tend to be anti-abortion, where Protestants have kind of, uh, and I'm, of course, very broadly saying Protestant is just anyone who is a Catholic, um, have uh, kind of been all over the place with this. And the early American Protestants were pretty much disinterested in abortion as, as, a, as a political subject. And as Anya mentioned, it's not really till like the late 20th century that there's this big shift and like the pro-life movement becomes a thing. Got it. Interesting. Okay. That's, that's a good note. I actually didn't know that before this podcast. Um, okay. One last kind of ethical consideration, Anya, mm-hmm. I want to I wanna hear from, uh, from you on. Um, and Gabriel, you can make the kind of uh, pro-choice augmentation to this if you like after Anya responds. Um, but a common uh, argument uh, in favor of abortion rights is effectively, I would call this almost a utilitarian argument or a consequentialist argument, but that uh, the practicality of making it illegal has some uh, kind of unpleasant ramifications, things like it conjures ideas of things like throwing underprivileged, uh, young women in jail because Mm -hmm. they, uh, had an abortion for whatever reason, Uh, likewise throwing doctors in jail because they facilitated said Mm -hmm. abortion or nurses that were involved in the process. Um, so when we talk about kind of criminalizing, uh, criminalizing abortion, are we, are we talking about throwing mothers in jail, throwing doctors in jail or what, what are we talking about here? So that was one of the arguments that really took off right between the leak of the Dobbs decision, the Dobbs decision coming down and all the subsequent laws that were changing in the States. Really one of the biggest lies um, was that women are going to start going to prison left and right for miscarriages, for um, abortions that they need, for um, all these horror stories that were being depicted, um, which like, have you been hearing that? Like, has that been happening? No, there was a big story that blew up of of this woman's being put in prison for her and her mom because her mom helped her get an abortion and she's going to prison. It was in Nebraska, I think. Um, But then you like read further and she self aborted, like burned her, burned her baby and, and like planned it in Facebook messenger with her mom. Um, And and there's a lot to that story, but um, no, People, women are not going to jail for abortion, and that's not the goal of any policy, pro-life policy organization that is around. Um, the idea is that a woman isn't as culpable because a doctor knows, medically knows, what he's seeing, what he or she is seeing. They, they know um, what a baby is, and they choose to do it anyways. I mean, they're the ones that have to, if you're talking about a a DNC or suction abortion. They're the ones that have to count the pieces of the baby, put the baby back together and count the pieces and make sure it's all there to prevent infection. Um, to be brutally honest, um, the mom may never see the, the sonogram. The mom may never see the baby. The mom may never be told how far along she is. She, she's being counseled by someone who has profit to make and she's in crisis um kind of like asking for someone's signature under duress or forcing someone to into marriage or else like you have to be fully knowledgeable and, and fully willing and the, the argument that pro-lifers make is that she's not and some may say that that is um that is um you know talking down to the woman or, or um what's the word um uh, Make, now that word's not coming to me making uh talking to her ch- as a child um infantilizing i'm like i know infant it's something like that <laughs> um infantilizing um however i think everyone would agree that the psychology of someone in crisis is not fully rational and um to make a decision like a life or death decision with under the counseling of someone who has profit to make um is not a, a fully willing and knowledgeable participant always. Yep. That makes sense. So so kind of small clarification or follow-up question of that then. You can even feel free to contextualize this in the context Mm -hmm. of Mississippi, wherever else, I don't care. But like when we say abortion is banned, that means it's illegal. And if something's illegal, someone has to get in trouble for violating said law. Like who does? It's the doctor. So when I was um, working on the Life Equality Act and and we made it a criminal uh, offense um, by the doctor, it's because the the patient could say, oh, I just found out this baby has Down syndrome, or I just found out that I'm having a boy and I wanted a girl, um, or, or my boyfriend's of another race and my family's never going to accept it. I need this abortion. Legally, once they heard that reason, they could not sign off on it. Now, it's not illegal for a woman to go and request it and try to get it, but that doctor is the one that is held responsible for following the state law. And if they violate 
the state law, then they're the criminal. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. Um, she can't, she can't do it without him, yep. the doctor. Yeah. Okay. Got it. That makes a ton of sense. Now, uh, kind of in, uh, I think that covers most of the ethical kind of discussions mm -hmm. around this. Gabriel, do you have anything else to add or any other questions before I move on to the kind of closing about what the future looks like? Um, no, I, I, I think the big central argument is ultimately what are rights? Where do they come from? When do they start? Mm -hmm. And there's so much deep philosophical tradition to dive into there that it's just not enough to, to tackle it in one podcast right. from religious convictions to atheist convictions. And I just encourage anyone who's curious about this to don't just take rights for granted. You really need to look into where do these come from? Why do we have them? And when do they start? Yeah. And, and I would like to add, if anyone's interested in the thalidomide argument, um, as to, you know, could you take thalidomide knowing it would harm your baby, um, while you're pregnant and cause loss of limbs, um, look at equal rights Institute's blog. And if anyone's interested in chemical abortion, like Gabriel was mentioning that the, what does the first pill do? What does the second pill do? What are the complications? What are the ER visits and Medicaid stats showing is happening since this has been widespread. That is at Charlotte Lozier Institute. They have studies. Got it. Those are very useful resources. I appreciate yeah. it. Now, in closing here, let's talk a little bit about the future. So the first question is uh, related to kind of legal rights and abortion in the United States. Effectively, the pro-life movement won insofar as like they got the, they slayed their big dragon, right? You guys, mm -hmm. you, you slayed the road dragon. Um, what next? What, what even is the goal now? Uh, is, it, is it trying to get it banned on a state by state level or what, what, what's, what's the angle now? So it really just began the fight. I mean, it sounds like the end. It was the end of an era. But it's the beginning of, of the state battle, 100 fights instead of one fight, which now we luckily have the freedom to do. So, for instance, North Carolina had their big fight. Just one example, had their big fight. Are we going to ban abortion at first trimester or 15 weeks? What are we doing? Come to a consensus as a pro-life community and then fight the pro-choice community. Um, so that kind of battle is going on in every state. Um, there are states that foresaw this coming, like New York, and put abortion into their state constitution. So that was smart move on their part. The next move is ballot initiatives. So a lot of states are doing what they need to create a ballot initiative because look, Trey spent a lot of time learning about ballot initiatives for some reasons. Uh, and this is a, a different way to fight it. So it's really a hundred fights instead of one fight. And um, from the pro-life perspective, you know, when I was like 17 or 18, I used to say, well, if Roe ever overturns, like I'm not going to support a federal ban um, because it's a state's issue. And there are still a lot of conservatives and pro-lifers who say it's a state issue, leave it up to the states. The problem with that is allowing thousands and tens of thousands of what we call human beings to die. And like, do we really allow that to happen? Um, doesn't that become a federal issue, especially when groups like the FDA are are uh, promoting the abortion pills when there are federal um, policies about like the VA and abortion and, and um, abortions on the reservation, reservations, abortions on abroad, abortions on, on water. Um, it is like uh, undeniably becomes a federal issue. Um, so right now the consensus is trying to pass a 15 week ban federally and some pro-lifers argue that that's not far enough, but based on polling, that is as aggressive as the pro-life movement feels like it can be right now and have some legs to that battle. So that's what's going to be coming up again. Um, that's what everybody's gearing towards, and that's what the questions are going to be about in the presidential race. Got it. That makes a ton of sense. All right. Final question, and this one's more of almost a fun one, if you will. Um, uh, I'm very curious your take on this, and then uh, and that'll be it. So as our audience is probably no doubt aware about me by this point, you two certainly know I am a radical techno-optimist and accelerationist. And this <laughs> issue, much like many others, I uh, am not super like concerned about in the present day for the sole reason that I feel fairly confident technology obviates the problem eventually. And what I'm referencing here is artificial wombs. So we mm -hmm. eventually get to a point technologically, we're not far off from this now. We've already successfully done this for several other mammal species and brought them to, to gestation and they've had healthy, healthy animals in completely artificial wombs outside of the outside of the mother entirely. Um, so my uh, kind of only personal opinion on this is kind of like, uh, uh, yes, uh, I'm like pro-life and I think the, the problem obviates itself in 20 or 30 years. So I'm kind of curious, this is a long ways off. So this is, I'm sure there's not like an official pro-life position. I'm more curious your thoughts mm. specifically in using this framework. 
um, what are, what's the pro-life position on, on artificial wombs? Like, could you, could we live in a world where like, yes, there is no abortion, but there's no abortion because uh, if a woman doesn't want the child, she just uh, gives it to an artificial womb funded by conservative pro-life activists. Uh, and then the baby's uh, brought to mm. full gestation and put up for adoption. Yeah. So it feels like a throwback because we've been arguing about things like designer babies since we met like maybe 19 or 20 years old, <laughs> we're yep. arguing about this. Um, well, I would say as a Catholic, it's going to be opposed. Mm -hmm. um, Catholics don't believe in carrying out IVF um, or surrogacy or um, contraception. So this would definitely be in that bucket um, of unnatural procreation um, that interferes with mar marital sex and the, the point of sex within marriage. Um, not that you have to get pregnant every time you have sex. Let me just say it, throw that out before someone says that. Um, you can look into Humana Vitae if you would like. Um, so I think it would be a similar situation to embryo adoption. Uh, Catholics and a lot of conservatives that aren't Catholics um, do not uh, believe in creating embryos that are going to be destroyed. Sometimes people become pregnant or don't continue their IVF process, but they've now fertilized a lot of embryos and they don't want those embryos to be destroyed. And so they have the option of placing that embryo for adoption, um, terminating their parental rights to the embryos, and then they're frozen until someone adopts them, um, which I've known people who have started this process or gone through this process. And so we're talking about um, snowflake babies, George Bush, like the coolest thing George Bush did um, <laughs> was, was, um, bring like all these snowflake babies to the Oval Office, like all these babies that were em frozen embryos that were like letter later gestated in, in this, an adoptive parent. I think it's a really cool option for people who find adoption expensive for people who want to adopt, but want to be pregnant. Um, however, the situation probably shouldn't exist based on the, our beliefs about IVF. So I would say it is a, happy um response to a uh, unfortunate problem i would say the same thing about artificial womb that if people are doing artificial wombs um and as a result people choose life and are putting those babies in there and it's working out and that those children are living um okay like i guess that's a happy happy mistake as bob ross would say but um I don't like it, it to begin with. I don't yeah. like the option to begin with. Um, so that would be my position. Yep. That makes sense. Awesome. Well, that concludes our abortion discussion for today. Um, everyone, if you enjoyed this, please like subscribe, comment on this, share yeah. it with your, uh, share it with your friends. So you can prove to them. You can in fact discuss this without wanting to throw punches by the end of it. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Yeah. Fulton says, um, <laughs> and thank you so much for joining us Anya. We really appreciate your time. Yeah, of course. And first podcast at eight weeks old. Ain't that. That's exciting, right. exciting. Got a strong start already. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you.